So last week we finished up talking about acids and bases and we did that acid base lab too with the cabbage indicators. Um, and we said that there's a couple of definitions that are used commonly for acids and bases. The Arrhenius definition said that acids produce protons, which are thought of as H plus in solution, where bases produce hydroxide, OH minus in solution. And then we went through and we saw a list of common acids and bases. Some were strong and some were weak. What makes an acid a strong acid? Anybody remember? It yeah, it completely dissociates into anions and cations, right? Where a weak acid doesn't completely dissociate. It likes to stay um, covalently bound to its proton. And then we said that the definition needed to be revised, and this occurred with Bronsted and Lowry in the early 1900s, and they said that not all bases produce hydroxide, and protons, as H+, plus, don't really exist in solution. So they said a better definition is that acids donate protons, almost like a baton being handed off, and bases receive a proton. So in this case, we had ammonia, where it's basically reaching out, and it's grabbing that proton off of hydrochloric acid, and we're getting a, a salt out of this. And then we said, conversely, if you've got hydroxide, hydroxide can reach out and grab a proton off of water, and vice versa, water can act as a weak base and grab a proton off of an acid. So today we're going to extend that a little bit. And I've got a short video to show you guys too. So this is really relevant chemistry. So metal oxides and non-metal oxides will react with water to form acids and bases. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the question is, what is a non-metal oxide? It's going to be something on the right-hand side of the periodic table with some oxygens on it, right? Pretty easy. So let's take a few examples. What's a really common non-metal oxide that we breathe out? CO2, CO2 carbon dioxide. Carbon's a non-metal. So CO2 plus H2O will react and form h 2 CO3. This is also known as carbonic acid. And if you've ever had carbonated water, you've probably tasted that carbonic acid, right? I, some people can really notice the taste with sparkling water. It tends to be a little bit more uh, tart or bitter, depending on your taste buds. But it has a unique flavor because you've actually changed that water into something that's more acidic than it's normally. Um, found at a neutral pH. And so really what we're observing is that water reacts with non-metal oxides to make acid. There's also another good example of SO2, sulfur dioxide, where that reacts with water. And you'll actually get two different acids that really quickly interconvert. The first one that you get is H2SO3. This is called sulfurous acid. And then the next one that we get, I'm just going to do a dashed arrow, we're not going to get into this mechanism, is this will interconvert to sulfuric acid. So you might be wondering, why the heck are we talking about this? Why does it matter? Well, SO2, sulfur dioxide, is a really nasty gas that's released from primarily coal-powered uh, uh, electricity plants. So if you're ever out on the East Coast and you see a coal-fired plant, you might want to look downwind. It's a little bit surreal, but what you'll see is something that looks like this, basically a whole hillside where all the trees are dead. Has anybody seen that on the East Coast? It's weird. I remember growing up hearing about acid rain and not really taking it seriously because in the Northwest we don't see it very much. Does anybody know why we don't have an acid rain problem over here? What do you think? 
Yeah, so that's one good thing is our uh, air current is pushing everything east. So that's one reason we don't see it. Does anybody know another reason? Yeah, exactly. Washington really doesn't rely very heavily on coal. We're mostly powered through um, our dams and uh, Hanford, our power plant, right? So if you are in an area that relies heavily on coal industries, the big problem is trying to remove that SO2, that sulfur dioxide, before it gets out of that smokestack, because as soon as it does, it will react with the moisture in the air to form sulfuric acid, that will rain down and kill all of the plants that are downwind and drastically impact that ecosystem. So there's been a big push towards switching away from coal towards what? Does anybody know? Solar? Solar is a great one, but even before that, what's another stepping stone? Or natural gas, right? So natural gas is thought of as cleaner because you don't have all of this SO2 getting spit out when you're burning it. It mainly just produces CO2, right? CO2 is, in the grand scheme of things, a lot better than SO2. However, is CO2 very good? No. Oh, what's the downside with CO2? It's a greenhouse gas, and if we look at this, CO2 forms another acid as well. It's just not as strong of an acid. This is a really, really, really big deal that a lot of times the media and just around town you never hear about. But I wanted to show you guys a brief video talking about the problem of CO2 getting into our water. I'm going to pull this up on YouTube. Oh no. They won't let me blow it up. Well, it's going to be small. <laughs> I'll try to zoom in. We have an incredibly productive ocean. When we go out there and do our research, when I'm waiting for the instrument to come up, you know, I, I can see salmon jumping, which is, that's amazing. This issue of ocean acidification that threatens that ability to rely commercially on these resources and also to rely on them recreationally, socially, and culturally. About 25 to 30% of the CO2 that's released from fossil fuel combustion ends up in the ocean. That lowers pH, and it also changes something we call saturation state, which is the corrosivity of that water. Based on the chemistry of the water and how marine life respond to chemistry. The kinds of organisms that we think are most vulnerable are the ones that build a shell. So oyster shells, clam shells, and corals. I think the things that are most important to the public to understand is that what this issue is threatening is our, some of our food supply. There are people's livelihoods and generations of watermen who rely on producing oysters and other shellfish. So if we talk about ocean acidification, what we're talking about is a change in carbonate chemistry of the ocean due to the increase in atmospheric CO2 from fossil fuel combustion, as well as other local processes that change that chemistry. And so the issue comes in is that we're changing that chemistry faster than we have in the last million years in the Earth's history. And that's having predictable consequences on the chemistry, as well as consequences on the organisms that we're just starting to understand now. So we've identified the Oregon coast as one of these early impact systems. So our chemistry is already changing and has changed dramatically. The waters that reach Oregon's coast, if you stand on the coast and look out and see this great blue expanse, you think, oh, that's just one big bathtub of water. You're not quite sure what's there, where it's coming from. But over the years, we understand very well how that water gets there. And that water reaches Oregon shore from far across the North Pacific, off to the northeast of Japan, actually. When it's at the atmosphere, it gets the oxygen and the CO2 from the atmosphere mixed into it. It's cold enough there that the water gets dense or heavy and it sinks down to beneath the waves to about a couple hundred meters and starts this long journey across the North Pacific. And there are actually two branches. One of them comes across the northern Gulf of Alaska. Another one takes this amazingly convoluted route. Along that path, the oxygen gets lower, 
the CO2 goes up, the pH goes down, it gets more acidic before it reaches Oregon shores. So if you think about the rising CO2 levels in the atmosphere, the water we're seeing at depth off Oregon has the signature of many decades ago. Even if we absolutely stop the CO2 emissions today and, and cap the atmospheric levels, there's still a 30 to 50 year increase we're going to see before that carbon, at least along our coast, works its way out. The effects that we're seeing, the changes that we're seeing in the chemistry of the ocean that affects everything there, all living things and non-living things also, are changing it in ways that are going to adversely affect the things that people care about because it's affecting the creatures that live there and their habitat. All right, I'm gonna stop it there. You're welcome to pull up this video. It's honestly one of the most alarming aspects of environmental chemistry today. The fact that they said we could stop everything we are doing today and it will continue to climb for the next 50 years in our ocean. And this is an entire ecosystem that covers what, like 70% of our planet? It's very, very big in terms of the scale and it's something that we need to talk about more as um, a society and try to address in a meaningful way. There was actually a report last year in um, the Seattle Times talking about the oyster industry in Puget Sound. We actually have it worse than the Oregon coast because we've got a lot of freshwater runoff. The freshwater runoff is actually more acidic than the ocean water. So the entire oyster industry in the Puget Sound region is freaking out right now and a lot of them are shutting down and trying to move to better geographies where they're at least going to delay the impact of this ocean acidification. But it's a really interesting problem. I went to a talk a couple years ago by a NOAA scientist and he said in the next 50 years, basically all of the coral reefs on the planet are gonna die. So we don't understand very much about our ocean ecosystem. It's huge, it's very complicated, there's a lot going on. But basically all the scientists out there are raising their hands and like flailing and being like, hey, pay attention, pay attention. And oftentimes it's getting overshadowed by other stuff. So it's something to really think about anytime you're talking with people is anytime they bring up climate change, you should think it's not just climate change, it's ocean acidification too. They're closely coupled together. So enough of that. Let's talk about other stuff. <laughs> we'll get back to that a little later though and I'll show you guys a cool math example showing how severe the problem actually is. There's also another reaction so we saw that it react, water will react with metal or non-metal oxides, but it can react with metal oxides as well. And if you have water around, it will react with a metal oxide to form base. So will that raise or lower the pH if we're forming a base? will raise the pH closer to 14, right? So there are a few examples I wanted to show you, although these aren't as large of a concern from an environmental chemistry point of view. First one is if you've got something like CaO, what would the name of this compound be? Calcium oxide. So calcium oxide plus water is going to react to form this new compound. And what would we call this new compound? Calcium hydroxide. And why is calcium hydroxide basic? Yeah, we've got OH, we've got hydroxide. So according to that Arrhenius definition, this is one of the classic bases. Same thing is true for potassium oxide, K2O plus water. You can react this and form two equivalents of potassium hydroxide. So in each of these examples, you're forming hydroxide bases, which we said previously are usually found in strong bases. So does that make sense? All right, so big difference between metal oxides and non-metal oxides. Now let's talk again about pH, even though we covered it in lab a little bit. And I wanted to show you something a little bit more lighthearted than the death of our oceans. Um, this was a picture I found from a health food store. And I want you guys to tell me why it's wrong.
Most tap water is neutral. Yeah, most tap water is actually kind of acidic. But what do you notice right there? Lemons and limes have a pH of 10. Is that true? What do you guys find with uh, acidic stuff like lemons and limes? It's below 7. So they're saying lemons and limes are uh, pH of 10. That's simply wrong. <laughs> That's an alternate fact if you want to choose that. If we go down here, there's also some crazy ones. pH of 3 is associated with lack of sleep, apparently. Um, processed foods also have a pH of 3, whatever that means. Uh, microwave foods also have a pH of 3. <laughs> there's some goofy stuff on here. I've seen this a lot in health food stores lately. There's this, like, for whatever reason, this new fad of drinking water that has a pH that's higher than 7. Have you guys seen that? They claim it like your body's too acidic and you need to neutralize it. That's so full of baloney. Your body's really good at controlling its pH. So ignore this stuff that you see in health food stores sometimes. They don't really know what they're talking about because they haven't taken chemistry classes. So if we look at a normal pH scale, it looks more like this, right? And we said in this region, between 0 and 7, this is acidic. We said at this point, at pH of 7, it's neutral. And anything that's greater than 7 is going to be basic. All right, so if we think about common substances, your stomach acid is going to be around a pH of 2. Colas, like Coke, are going to be around uh, 2.5. They have phosphoric acid in them, if you remember that. Oranges and um, lemons are usually between 3 and 4. Tomatoes between 4 and 5. Urines between 5 and 7. And then if you have pure water before CO2 has a chance to get dissolved in it, that will be at a pH of 7. However, most fresh rainwater has a pH way below 7 because it's absorbed a lot of CO2. And then in terms of bases, you've got things like household ammonia, antacids, and even seawater. Seawater is typically between a pH of around 8-ish, um, although we're going to show you a math problem later that shows how quickly that's changing. But it's a really important thing to understand that this pH scale is a measure of acidity, um, not a measure of lack of sleep or any goofy things like that. So if you go through your book, you can look at some common pHs. If you ever want to check at home, you can do it really easily with that purple cabbage test that we did in lab, though. So let's define pH in a little bit more detail. Does anybody remember what pH equals? What does the P stand for? Is it a mathematical operator? So P is the same thing as negative log. So pH is really just negative log times the concentration of H plus. And this is usually measured in molarity. In moles per liter. OK, if you're familiar with log rules, we can calculate the concentration of H plus by doing some mathematical moves. How can we calculate this based on the above equation? Any of you guys familiar with log rules? Yeah, it'd be 10 to the negative pH. So you can also do the reverse, where you do 10 to the negative pH to find your concentration of hydronium or um, hydrogen ions in solution. There's also the sister equation, that's pOH, which is negative log of the concentration of hydroxide. And same sort of thing, you can say, you know, the concentration of hydroxide is going to be equal to 10 to the negative pOH. These are really closely related. It depends on whether or not you're measuring acidity or basicity. However, nine times out of 10, you're going to be looking at pH, not pOH. It's somewhat uncommon. The nice thing with this is that pH plus pOH always equals 14. 
So if they give you the value of one, you can try to figure out the value of the other, right? So if I say the pH of a solution is two, you could say, well, the pOH must be 12, right? So just use some simple math to flip back and forth between these. So let's do a few practice problems. If you've got a calculator, you might want to pull that out. Does anybody know what acid is in lemon juice? Citric acid, yeah. So citrus fruits have citric acid. That means they've got a pH below seven because they're acidic. So now what we need to do is determine the concentration of acid in lemon juice, so H plus. I'll give you a minute to work on that. So which equation do you think we should use, first of all? The one on the left or the right? On the right, I'd say. We want to solve for the concentration, not solve for pH. So if you are debating about which one to use, this one would make a heck of a lot more sense than the one on the left. So it should be 10 to the what? 10 to the 2.1? 10 to the negative 2.1. Don't forget that negative. Does anybody have their calculator? Zero point zero zero seven nine. Why didn't you say 794328? It should only have two sig figs in it, right? Okay, so if we look at this, we're halfway there. We've got the number. What should the units be? Yeah, molar or moles of H plus per liter of solution. So this tells us the concentration of acid that's present in every one liter of lemon juice. Does that make sense? Are you guys getting it in your calculator? Or? Oftentimes, too, I'll show you a trick for the calculator. If you're typing it in, do 10, and then that up arrow, and then in parentheses, do negative 2.1. Sometimes if you don't do the parentheses, depending on your calculator, you can get goofy responses. Did that work? Yeah? OK. If it didn't work, you can stop me after class and we can take a look at your calculator. All right, let's try a couple more. All right, for this next one, what is the pH of a 1.0 molar hydrochloric acid solution. So HCl is hydrochloric acid, and then we need to determine the pH of a one molar solution of HCl.
Who thinks they got this one already? One person? Two people? So which equation should we use? Should we use pH equals negative log of H plus, or should we say H plus equals 10 to the negative pH? Negative log. Yeah, I would say use the pH equals negative log equation, because we're trying to solve for pH, right? So we'd say pH equals negative log of the concentration of H plus. OK, so we'd say pH equals negative log of 1.0 molar, which gives us a pH of what? Zero. <laughs> So it is a little bit weird that you can't have a pH that's exactly zero when it's one molar HCl, but that has to do with the log rules. It is important to remember, too, anytime you see an increase of one pH, it's not that it's a little bit more acidic. It's an order of magnitude more acidic. Everything's on the log scale, so every jump you have is really a tenfold increase. And that's really important to consider anytime you see a variation of pH. So let's jump into our challenge problem. I'm going to scroll down here. And this is related to our ocean acidification video. These are called sea butterflies. And these are pictures of their larval shells as they're exposed to different pHs over time. Yep? So for pH equal negative log, we use that when we solve for pH. And then the pOH. You can use that for concentration of hydroxide. So pOH is used anytime you're asked about hydroxide, not acid. Yeah, nine times out of ten, though, you're going to be working with pH. I just wanted to introduce it to you guys in case you do see it. So these little sea butterflies, their cells or shells degrade as they're exposed to acid over time. And this is a really big problem because a huge amount of predators in the ocean ecosystem rely on these for food, right? So if they're dying at their larval stage, they're never going to grow up and they won't be a food source for larger animals. So let's take a look at why this is a problem. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, we had a pretty steady pH level. The pH of the oceans was right around 8.25. Was 8.25. Is that basic or acidic? Basic. So slightly basic. Today the pH is 8.1 approximately. Let's do 8.14. We'll keep the sig fix the same. And we're actually projected to go all the way down to about 7.8 at the end of the century. So this is going to require some math, but what I want us to do is to calculate how much more acid there is in the ocean today compared to the pre-industrial levels, and then how much acid will be, how much more acid will be in the ocean by 2100. So I'll write down kind of what I'm asking for. And I'm looking for a percent. And then I want you to do the same thing for 2100, but I'll show you guys a little bit of how I would solve this. So I would do 1 minus the current concentration over the pre-industrial 
concentration times 100 gives you your percent increase. So let's work on the first part and then see if we get the right answer and then I'll have you guys do the projection for 2100. And then if you think you got to check with your neighbor too. Yeah. Is that okay? You guys think you got it back there? You got it? Well, if you have the one line, it doesn't make your answer negative. Uh, it shouldn't. I don't believe so. Right, because it's one minus a fraction. So it should be still a number greater than one. Am I doing this right? Let me double check. <laughs> oh, shoot. Sorry, I do have them flipped. Wait, no. Sorry. Making me second guess myself. Am I doing this right? One minus. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to move this over. Typo. So do that minus one times 100. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, as long as you take away the negative, it should be the same. So what are you guys getting as a percent increase? Anybody got it? 1.33. Let's check. So current concentration, how can we figure that out? Yeah, 10 to the negative pH. What's our current pH? 8.5. Eight point one four, right? Divided by the pre industrial pH, which was negative eight point two five, right? We'll do this minus one times one hundred. What are you guys getting? You didn't put the ten? Yeah, remember pH you have to do that conversion to find the concentration, right? What are you guys getting? Anybody want to throw out an answer? Like crickets in here. 
This is a calculator test to see if you know how to put in all the parentheses in the right spots. Twenty eight point eight, that's what I'm getting. So twenty eight point eight percent increase in H plus concentration. So our acid concentration in our oceans since the early 1900s to today has gone up 28%. It doesn't look like much when you look at the pH, right? It's like, oh, 8.25, 8.14, what's the big deal? It only went up by 0.1. But, like I said, this is a log scale. That 0.1 is roughly equivalent to a 28.8% increase in acid. That's a really big deal. Can you imagine if all of a sudden you started eating 28.8% more food every day? You get large real quick. Let's do the same thing for percent increase that's projected for 2100. From the original. zoom out so we can see all the levels again. So pre-industrial was 8.25. We're projecting it out to Anybody have an answer for this one? This one's more shocking. This one, I even, when I went to a seminar, I like double checked this three times on my calculator because I was convinced I did something wrong. Yeah. So we've got 10 to the what on the top? negative 7.80 divided by 10 to the negative 8.25 we'll do minus 1 times 100 is anybody able to get an answer that was greater than 100 here what were you guys getting so around 182 yeah so 182 percent increase in H plus. So like I said, scientists are out there waving their arms saying, please pay attention, please pay attention. This is a serious, serious, serious problem. We're going to face an entire ecosystem collapse unless we do something. And this is why. Small changes in pH completely mess up our ocean ecosystems. If you go on and take any environmental science courses or oceanography courses, you'll study a lot more about this. But it's pretty alarming, and it's related directly to basic chemistry behind pH. Does that make sense? All right. Let's just do a few practice problems. We'll do multiple choice, and then if we have any time, we'll go back and do more math problems. Okay, according to the Arrhenius theory, an acid is any substance that dissolves in water to produce what? Not everybody all at once. <laughs> H plus, right? So acids produce H plus. What do bases produce according to the Arrhenius theory? OH, right? So in this case, A would be the best answer. 
All right, 7.2, many metal oxides, such as sodium oxide, dissolve in water to produce what? Bases, right? We said non-metal oxides produce acids, metal oxides produce bases. Let's do a couple others. What is the product when selenium dioxide reacts with water? This one's a little trickier. You might want to flip through your notes. So to give you guys a hint, we said CO2 plus water makes what? This carbonic acid, what was the molecular formula for that? H2CO3. Okay, so this equation looks pretty dang similar, right? These are both non-metal oxides. Really, the only difference is we're changing a selenium with a carbon, right? So knowing that, this final product here should have that carbon swapped out with the selenium, which means which one is going to be our best answer? D, right? So in this case, it's more just trying to match it to a similar non-metal oxide. They have very similar reactivity. Okay. Which of the following compounds is a strong acid? This one's a little trickier. So top one, we've got nitric acid. Next one down, we've got phosphoric acid. Next one down, we've got carbonic acid. That's H2CO3 that we just talked about. D is acetic acid. That's vinegar, and then E is boric acid. This one's a little tricky. I'll give you guys some hints. So B, phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid's found in sodas. Do you think that's gonna be a super duper crazy strong acid? Probably not super good for your teeth, but it's not gonna be acutely harmful at that concentration. So B, it's not super duper strong. What about C? Carbonic acid? I mean, it is an acid, but it's not a crazy strong one. You guys drink seltzer water, I'm sure, or carbonated water. D, vinegar, vinegar, yeah, I mean, it's an acid, but it's not a crazy strong acid. Boric acid, not super strong either. Nitric acid, on the other hand, if you get it on your skin in its concentrated form, will give you almost an instantaneous chemical burn and will make your skin puff up, give you a nasty scar. So nitric acid is a very strong acid. How do we define strong acids again? Completely dissociates. They're not in equilibrium. They're not going back and forth. They just form only ions, and then they're stuck there. That's the definition of a strong acid. Yep? So we have a problem like that. How do we figure out? I would give you more information. <laughs> Yeah, so if I gave you something that had like a pH of 6 versus a pH of 1, which one's going to be the stronger acid? pH of 1. Yeah, so you'd have to have more information. I'm not going to make you guys memorize the whole pKa or pH table or anything like that. Let's do a couple more and then we'll call it good for the day. What would be the products of the following reaction? So phosphoric acid plus potassium hydroxide. What do we call these reactions when we have an acid and a base? What happens when you mix an acid and a base? Do you get an acid out, a base out, or a neutral? Yeah, so it's a neutralization reaction. You should get a salt in water, right? So we should get H2O plus an ionic compound. Anybody think they got this one? Let's break it up into pieces, right? So phosphoric acid, H3PO4, that means we've got three protons. And our phosphate polyatomic anion should have what charge? 
3 minus, right? In order to bounce out the three positives. Okay, and then over here we've got hydroxide. So we've got potassium, we've got three of them, so I'm gonna draw it three times. And then hydroxide must have what charge? Negative one. Oh. So negative, negative, negative. Okay, so we're gonna try to form water from the protons and hydroxide. So I'll say, hey, these three can combine with these three to form three waters. So I'm gonna plug in a three up here. I'm gonna say three H3O. And then what do you think this ionic compound is gonna be that we're missing? Yeah, it'd be K3PO4 or potassium phosphate because that's really just what's left over. So it'd be k 3 PO4. So if we go down here, the only one that fits would be B. No, no. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. That's why I keep you around. I looked at that completely wrong. So K3PO4 plus three waters is the right answer. Good catch. All right, last one, and then you guys can go enjoy the weather. All right, 7.6. A solution with uh, acid or H plus concentration of one times 10 to the eighth molar would be considered what? What do you think we should do first? We've got concentration, but we don't know pH. Maybe solve for pH? How do we solve for pH here? Which equation? Yeah, the negative log one. So pH equals negative log of our H plus or H3O plus. You may see it written either way. Okay, so that'd be negative log times one times 10 to the negative eight. That should be a pH of what? Eight, right? So using log rules, this is a pH of eight. Is that? Basic or acidic? Basic. Is it super duper basic or just kind of? Slightly. So I'd say slightly basic would be the correct one for that. All right, remember to get started with your sapling. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me or stop by.